Hello, welcome to our lunch and learn today. What's for lunch, George? Using BDD or behavior driven development for continuous product discovery. That's delicious. <laughs> Yes, so if you are here with us and you can hear us, I would like you to type what you're having for lunch in the chat just so we can make sure that everything is working and give folks a couple more seconds to join us before we kick off. Um, in today's webinar, you will be able to earn one Scrum Alliance SEU and one PMI PDU. So details about that will be emailed out after, or you can always contact us at info at lightspeed.com. And George and I work at Lightspeed. Lightspeed is a premier agile consultancy based in the DC area. Uh, George is based in the DC area. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. But that really doesn't matter right now because we are all virtual all the time. So check out some of our live online trainings. Let's check on the question. Noodles and sausage, Dean. Can we come over? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. If you are someone who is one minute late, if you can type what's for lunch. Oh, somebody's finishing breakfast. All right, Dallas, that's why. Mm. Yep. I do. I do second breakfast and then lunch, but all of that is is kind of before 11 a.m. So <laughs> Ham for breakfast. Okay, so we're here to lunch and learn. We're using BDD, Behavior Driven Development for Continuous Product Discovery. And we're here with George. You can see his beautiful face. George, you have been managing, coaching, and building software development teams with a heavy emphasis on DevOps practices um, over the past 20 years. So what do you mean heavy emphasis on DevOps? Well, I've worked uh, with many teams to uh build up a lot of their agile engineering practices, uh, test-driven development, which would include behavior-driven development, all the CICD practices, uh, doing whatever we can to facilitate fa fast feedback and uh, optimize our processes so that we can uh, reduce time to market. Awesome. And with that, Darnell did say he's having coffee and donuts for his lunch and learn. So it sounds like we're all, uh, we've got our drinks, we got our food, and we're ready to go. So feel free to kick it off. All right. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, and the format uh, going forward is I will be talking to these slides and uh, telling you a lot about BDD and continuous product discovery, how that fits into DevOps. Um, Following that, I will have a, a little demonstration uh, using some code uh, in a Java environment. And uh, then at the end of that, we'll have a nice little conversation and uh, Audrey will help facilitate that. All right, so uh, the first thing to understand is that BDD is about, oops, building the right thing. Uh, now a lot of times when we are talking about DevOps uh, and, and a lot of the tools and techniques I just mentioned, uh, the emphasis tends to be on a lot of those tools about making sure that we're using Jenkins or uh, Team City or a lot of the, the cloud tools and that we are uh, building products in the right way, that we are uh, using really good agile engineering disciplines uh, to have highly decoupled systems. But it really doesn't matter if we build things the right way if we're not building the right thing. And so the emphasis with behavior-driven development is to make sure that we really get to the heart of what the customer wants and use techniques like behavior-driven development to verify what that is. And once we have a, a good understanding about what the right thing is, or we're at least circling uh, what the right thing is, then we can actually start building it. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a continuous delivery pipeline um, as uh, conceptualized by Scaled Agile, the folks who put together the SAFE framework, the scale, Scaled Agile framework. Um, one thing that I like about uh, this picture is that you know, when we think about a continuous delivery pipeline, uh, often, as I was just mentioning, we don't 
what we focus on are the areas like continuous integration and continuous deployment and using a lot of those automation tools to try to uh, get product out to customers super fast. Uh, but the emphasis here um, starts with continuous exploration, which is also another way of saying continuous product discovery. This is a really important part of uh, DevOps. Uh, we must figure out what the right product is. And uh, in the Scaled Agile framework, when they're talking about DevOps, uh, they're talking about using uh, lean startup techniques, uh, lean UX, um, and a lot of the uh, uh, like tools like having a minimum viable product. Uh, what should go part and parcel with a lot of that is behavior-driven development because what we need to have when we're doing continuous product discovery is uh, using behavior-driven development to do a lot of the deliberate discovery. And once we have gone through waves of uh, behavior-driven development and deli deliberate dis discovery, then we can start into the other parts of this pipeline, such as continuous integration and continuous deployment. All right, so here's a very classic definition of behavior-driven development. It is collaboration and conversation to discover essential requirements and identify uncertainty using rules and examples expressed in a common language to build a shared understanding to deliver software that matters. Whew, that's a lot. There's a, there's a lot to uncover there. So what I'd like to do is focus on a handful of words and phrases in here to really drive at what behavior-driven development really is. So first, behavior-driven development is all about that conversation. Uh, if you don't have a conversation, uh, then you can't really just dive into writing out the the, the Gherkin syntax that is going to drive the automated acceptance tests. Um, the conversation is paramount. And really, if you think about it too, uh, if you're, you know, you've been working around the Agile Manifesto for a long time, you understand that we really value those conversations because the conversations are really where we're going to be driving out things like the rules and examples. And it really is about understanding not just the rules, but also having some concrete examples. And behavior-driven development is really all about having both of those working in conjunction with each other to drive out what it is that we're going to be building. And then finally, because we've had that conversation and because we've had that conversation about rules and examples, we get a shared understanding. And that shared understanding makes it so that we can really deliver something that is truly fit for purpose. Uh, all of this is in support of these items that are over on the right, such as aligning the stories with business goals, of course, clarifying our stories with rules and examples, documenting the rules and examples in a manner that can be read and easily understood by all team members and stakeholders, and then finally, creating tests that satisfy the documented specifications. And then this is also an important point to make, and that is that we should automate if possible. Behavior-driven development is really, really much more about the conversation and the collaboration, uh, less so about the automation. Of course, when we're talking about DevOps, we want to make sure that we automate as much as we possibly can. Uh, and what we want to really do is use the behavior-driven development to get some automated specifications. Uh, so, but we really want to make sure that we have that collaboration and that conversation first in order to get there. And then if we can automate, then we definitely need to. Okay, so. First is having that conversation before writing the code. And I like to always refer to these as test-driven conversations. I mean, we often talk about test-driven development, but 
really to get to the point where we're doing test-driven development, we need to have the conversation first. And so we need to have conversations that are centered around figuring out how to verify that we did the right thing. And so we need to have those test-driven conversations. So to start, BDD is the art of using rules and examples in conversations to illustrate behavior. If you've been working in Agile for any length of time, you are familiar with what a user story is. Um, and so we have all seen, you know, whether it's in JIRA or on a physical whiteboard or in whatever tool you use, we're familiar with something that at least looks like a post-it and having a user story on there. And uh, often there'll be some, some sort of uh, description of the story with some acceptance criteria that'll say something to the effect of as a reader um, if I buy three books the cheapest of the three should be free right and so that's a very typical thing that we want to have for any user story but when we take it to the next level using behavior driven development then we don't just accept what we commonly accept as a user story and and the acceptance criteria attached to it, what we then want to do is take these rules and illustrate them with some concrete examples, some actual scenarios uh, that will drive the tests that we're going to be writing. Um, and so in this case, some examples of the rules that we have here are if we have a cart that has $10, $15, $5 in it, um, then uh, the checkout total should be $26.50, um, which actually doesn't make sense now that I'm reading it, but uh, <laughs> we, we want to make sure that the example illustrates the rule that we have there. And All right, so anyhow, um, what we, I, and, and I'll, I'll be driving this home uh, with, through some other examples uh, shortly in the code example, um, what we want to do is when we have this conversation, we want to have something called a three amigos. Um, and this is now a, a, a commonly embraced term in Agile, uh, where we want to have at least uh, three perspectives uh, represented in this conversation, this BDD conversation. Um, and that's what is commonly referred to now as the three amigos. And they are uh, someone from business, someone from development, and a tester. And uh, that's not to say that we can't have other people in this conversation, but we have to have at least those three perspectives represented. Um, and when we have those three perspectives represented, uh, they come together and they have a shared understanding. Uh, it's really important to get that common understanding among those three people uh, so that you understand maybe what some of the limitations are on the development side so that the business is able to say here's what I want but then of course that the tester is there to say and ask the question well how are we going to test this how are we going to verify it and make sure that we actually have something that is aligned with what everyone wants and needs uh, in the coding example I'm going to be doing uh, with you a little bit later it's all about putting together a password that is not easy to crack. And so just imagine that as the user story. And then we'll use this technique here, or I'll illustrate with this technique here called example mapping, uh, pioneered by Matt Wynn. And what we do with example mapping is we first talk about all the rules that are associated with this user story. Uh, in this case, we want to make sure that there's a minimum of eight characters. Uh, another rule would be that uh, it has to be alphanumeric, mixed case, with at least one special character. Um, and there it will be some limitations on what some of those acceptable special characters are. And that uh, we also have a rule about a repeating pattern, that we can't have uh, three of the same uh, character represented uh, th three in a row, all right? So ordinarily, of course, when we put together our user stories without using this example mapping technique, 
those would be the rules. And, and what we have found over all these years is that uh, a lot of times, because language is imprecise, there are uh, a lot of misinterpretations that come out of it as to how this will be implemented. Uh, and if you don't have your three amigos meeting where there's a conversation about this uh, and you have a product owner that just kind of tosses the story over to the developer and the developer just uh, codes it up and then tosses it over to the tester, you know, there won't be a good understanding about how it's supposed to be developed, what the rules actually mean, how it's going to be tested. So the power here is in coming up with actual concrete examples that illustrate what those rules mean. Uh, so we have some green examples here uh, that are there to illustrate what are concrete rules or concrete examples of those rules. So FUBAR would not be valid under the rule of minimum of eight characters, and we would make sure that we say that in this example. But here is a valid one uh, represented by these two rules. So it, it does uh, exceed the minimum of eight characters, and it's alphanumeric, mixed case, at least one special character. Um, and then over here we have, I mean, if it weren't for this repeating pattern if with this rule, we would have a, a valid one here to represent these other two, but each one of these rules should be a constraint on the others, right? And then we should have some examples that illustrate all of that. Part of the power here of having the three amigos meeting to actually come up with some deliberate discovery of all this is to see if the story that is right here is right sized as well. So if we wind up coming up with a whole lot more rules, then maybe it would be a good indication that uh, we need to split the story up. And making things smaller will lead to better flow through the whole delivery process, which is, of course, a, a key concept, precept to DevOps. Um, and if we wind up having a lot of examples, that could be an indication that this is a very complex uh, user story to test, and that's something that we should uh, consider. Uh, the, a red card here in this example mapping uh, conversation is a question for maybe someone who's not involved in the meeting. And if we wind up with a lot of red cards, a lot of questions about this, then that's also a good indication that this story probably wasn't ready for prime time and uh, the product owner needs to go back and find some answer to those questions and then come back to the three amigos. So having the different viewpoints, forging that shared understanding is key for driving BDD. Once we have these concrete examples, then we can turn them into some actual acceptance scenarios and maybe some executable specifications. So once we've had that, we can capture the conversations and drive development, okay? And BDD provides us with a nice syntax here uh, called Gherkin for actually driving that. Uh, the great thing about Gherkin is that it really is very technology agnostic. Uh, it is supposed to be human readable, structured, keyword based. Uh, it provides excellent documentation, ongoing uh, documentation for what the expected behavior of your system is. And then once you have your uh, scenarios written out in the Gherkin syntax, you can then turn this into automated tests. So here's an abbreviated example of Gherkin, uh, and we'll see this in the code a little bit later. But at the top of this is a feature uh, or a description of a feature. And what you would have here is a documentation of what you expect uh, all of your scenarios will be verifying. So this is for what a valid password would be. And then underneath the features would be lots of individual scenarios. And then within the scenario, you have the common 
commonly understood Gherkin syntax of the given when then. So the given is typically there to express what the preconditions are that are necessary for actually running this test. The when is the action that is going to be taken. And the then is going to actually be testing what the uh, actual behavior was and verifying that the behavior was what we expected it to be when this action was taken. So given that we have a new user, when we select a password, that's the action, and this is the password that we provide, then this should be a valid password and we should be able to access the account. All right, very typical uh, scenario here of what Gherkin looks like. Uh, and really, I, I think something that must be mentioned here is that this truly is technology agnostic. Uh, Cucumber as kind of an umbrella technology that incorporates Gherkin in it has been ported to many different technologies. And you can take Gherkin feature files and you know, virtually unchanged from Java to .NET to Python to Go and bunches of other things, you can take these Gherkin feature files and incorporate them into these Cucumber extensions into other technologies, and then they just run. It's it's kind of uh, kind of magic there. All right, and then finally, once you have that Gherkin scenario, uh, all the scenarios within the features, you've expressed them in the common language then you can create something called uh, your step definitions, which is basically the glue code that uh, ties that Gherkin scenario to something that is actually automatable. And that can be done in a technology that, like I just mentioned, like Cucumber or Specflow or anything like that. Um, and that's where we would actually automate those specifications and then incorporate them in our CI-CD pipeline. Okay, so to review, the first thing we need to have is a conversation. That is the foundational principle uh, behind uh, BDD, Behavior Driven Development. Have that conversation, that three amigos test-driven conversation where at least business, developer, tester come together to have a common understanding of what the expected behavior is. You capture those conversations. Those conversations are written out in a syntax like Gherkin with that given when then. And once those conversations are captured, you can then automate them using that glue code. And once you have the glue code written and everything running and passing, you can incorporate those into your CI CD pipeline and you have a very nice layer of testing uh, that is automated, will tell you that the behavior is working, and uh, that layer of testing is there to supplement some of the other areas of the testing that you would have as part of your automation test strategy. Okay, so this is where it all fits into your continuous deployment pipeline. Uh, and I have an arrow right here in the middle that's pointing to this acceptance box. So what the reason why I have that there is to show that it's not necessarily the first line of testing defense. Uh, when we put together a continuous deployment pipeline, we still wanna make sure that we have a whole lot of unit tests. Those are not the BDD tests that I've been talking about. Um, but you wanna have those as the first line of tests that you have executed in your CI CD pipeline. Once all of those are passed, then you promote to the next level in your CI CD pipeline and you run the acceptance tests. And these acceptance tests are the BDD tests that I have been talking about. And they do that full automated end-to-end -end test. Uh, Behavior-driven development is much more, it's a, a black box test. Um, that tests the behavior um, rather than a unit test that tests the, the structure of the code and uh, really at the lowest level of your uh, um, of all of your code 
the white box testing that is fully knowledgeable of um, the implementation inside your code. But this is where in your continuous deployment pipeline, BDD fits in. Um, it is not necessarily intended to get you the super fast feedback you'd expect in your unit tests, but as you progress further and further into your pipeline, you're going to be getting a much higher level of confidence in more production-like environments, more production-like tests, that everything is, is good to go. Okay, and that is the end of the, uh, the presentation. Um, Audrey, are there any questions or do we want to open it up for questions before we go into any of the code? Yeah, let's open it up for some questions. We'll give you a minute to type in some thoughts here. Let's play some Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure while you're getting some stuff prepared, we'll have some questions roll in. So why don't you go ahead and move forward and then I'll shout when we have some, some sure. media questions. I will be happy to do so. All right. So to illustrate some of the stuff that I was talking about earlier, the most important thing to have to get all of this rolling, of course, after the conversation, is a feature file um, and this is a more extended feature file than what I was showing you earlier in that one slide and there are a lot of things in here so uh, one thing that is important to consider for all of this of course is that uh, as we talk about moving test, uh, all the test considerations further and further to the left. Um, one important aspect of that is to treat all of our test code as code and as a first class citizen. Uh, so it should be every bit as readable and maintainable as the application code that uh, we are testing. Uh, so it's this feature, while it isn't this, des this description doesn't necessarily drive any of the actual test automation itself. It's important to be really descriptive there about what the expected behavior is that we'll be testing in the scenarios. Likewise, when we have this scenario keyword, there isn't anything that um, is required after it, uh, except we really want to make sure that that's equally descriptive so that Really, if anything goes wrong, uh, you know, later today, next week, a month, a year from now, if a test fails and the person who wasn't, uh, who created it isn't around anymore, someone else can come along and uh, and maintain it, make sure that uh, everything is fixed and that they, you don't just put some Band-Aid on it and move on. We want to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Uh, so these scenario and feature descriptions are important for readability and maintainability. But then you'll notice that we have this given when then, these keywords in each one of these scenarios. And those actually do drive uh, how the, uh, these tests get executed, what needs to be written, how they get executed. And these scenarios are very plain vanilla Gherkin that are essentially executed as one scenario at a time. But then you get into some really more advanced features of Gherkin when you get down here and we can see these scenario outlines where we're able to uh, use some, some variables and actually test a whole lot of things at once. And so this scenario outline right here tests a lot of different combinations of valid password examples. So I'll have a given a new user when I select password right here, then as a, pass, as, as a password, then I can access my account. And down here are examples that'll be plugged into this one at a time. And all of these should be valid examples. Likewise, I have another scenario outline of invalid password examples. And this takes these this as a keyword and plugs in these different invalid passwords. Uh, these have 
examples of special characters that are unacceptable. This is a blank password. This doesn't have any mixed case or special characters, and those are the reasons why those are invalid. So with those outlines, we're able to do a lot more stuff at once um, and pass in some things, you know, really more programmatically. Now here is a really cool part of this. I don't actually have any uh, step definitions uh, mapped out right now. This is an empty class. And part of the magic of Cucumber is that when I go to run this, it won't find any matching step def definitions along with that. And when I run this, it's parsing it, it's going to be compiling, and it's going to say, oh, wait a second, uh, nothing worked there. And what I get instead is a whole bunch, it'll say there are missing steps that I can implement with these steps below. And I can just copy this. This is the magic of Cucumber. And I can paste that in there into my step definitions. And import that, sure. Um, now you'll notice that none of these will actually pass right now, right? So once I run these, it's going to throw a new pending exception. But what it, what's really nice is that it generated all the stubs for me that I can now fill in with the actual glue code that will get this running. But now I have something that I can run, and instead of getting the stubs, they're all going to basically fail because it threw a bunch of pending exceptions, OK? Um, now what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to basically treat this like a kind of a cooking show. And I'm going to paste in the actual working code here. And when I run this now, they all pass, okay? So I have, what you can see here is the actual implementation in each one of these. Uh, what is happening here as a, in a bit more detail is there are these decorators you can see. So this given and this when are decorators that match up with these items here. So given I am a new user, given I am a new user, when I select that as a password, then I can access my account, okay? Or I cannot access my account, and I receive an error message. And so all of these, when Cucumber generated those stubs, uh, it generated everything with these decorators that matched up with the keywords that are in these scenarios. And all I then had to do was come along and do the implementation to make this pass. And it doesn't really matter what you do at this point uh, as far as how you make this pass. You could actually make this very much like a unit test, but you already have, you should already have some level of unit testing. So that's probably not the best approach. What you would want to do is have something that's a bit more black box and implement this uh, through some other uh, means, maybe something like Selenium or, or something like that. Uh, but uh, these are the implementations that we can use to actually put the glue code in to take these uh, scenarios in the feature file and actually verify the behavior on the other end. Any questions? Ooh, boy, that's a loaded question, George. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we have we have a nice list of questions here, and some are quite involved. So I do want to say, if you could only join us for this first half of the presentation, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, if you need anything from our team, reach out to info at lifespeed.com. We're going to spend 
probably the next 20, 25 minutes. I'm going through some involved questions here. So George, put on your seatbelt. I'll try to start you off easy though. What is the best way to introduce this concept to teams that are still doing manual testing, manual deployments, et cetera? That, that is a great question. And I would say that um, really focusing on that, some of the first aspects that I talked about where uh, this really does emphasize the importance of the conversation really more so than the automation itself. You know, think about the Agile Manifesto. We really want to value the interactions and the individuals over the tools and techniques. We want to make sure that we value the conversations uh, over following any kind of a contract. BDD really strikes at the heart of this. And if you still are very much attached for one reason or another to doing things manually, um, you, I'm gonna guess, are likely to find some, uh, some areas of your process that are still rather error prone. Uh, a lot of times the reason for that is that people aren't talking as much as they should. And you can use behavior-driven development, the three amigos technique, to come up with concrete examples of, of the rules and have a good common understanding that can then be used as the guardrails for what gets tested later on. Whether you automate that or not uh, is secondary to the importance of actually having that conversation. So start with the conversation. And once you have those as good documentation and you can translate them into Gherkin, at some later date, you can then automate that. But just start with a conversation. All right, and so a question that follows on to that, um, someone listening in has a very passionate developer. So sometimes when we have the three amigos discussion, how can we politely stop him when he goes too deep in the weeds? Sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's like going down a rabbit hole and missing what we have to work on to complete the user's story. Um, well, it's probably good to have a scrum master as another perspective to help guide that conversation. Uh, I would sometimes also think that um, when you have that three amigos meeting, and you have the example, if that developer is uh, bringing up some really excellent solid points uh, there, or even questions, that could be an indication of a spot where the story is too big and could be uh, divided. Um, it could be an indication of some level of complexity that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, so I, I do understand uh, trying to limit the number of rabbit holes you go down, but I, I think uh, be patient and uh, try to figure out if, if these are opportunities uh, to, to make things smaller, because really ultimately what we wanna do too is to uh, limit our batch sizes to increase flow and maybe this developer is really, whether they know it or not, helping you move in that direction. Super. So we're gonna change directions here, George. How does BDD use the actual customer's input to ensure product discovery and validation? And this has an IE Marty Kagan and his book, um, Inspired, I think it was. Uh, so actual customers, I mean, Ultimately, it doesn't necessarily matter if the uh, BDD uh, Gherkin comes from the customer or some sort of a customer proxy. Uh, what we definitely wanna do is get the perspective of the customer, of the business as involved. And uh, so, you know, a big part of all of this is really doing some really good deliberate customer discovery. We might not uh, nail it the first time around. Uh, with DevOps, what we want to make sure that we're doing is shortening our cycles 
and getting feedback as quickly as possible. And part of that also is in making sure that we have enough telemetry built into our system to verify if we're building the right product all the time. Um, when we have really short cycles and we're collecting that data, then we can go back and figure out if, if we've actually been building the right thing. And we can use BDD to further refine uh, whether we're building the right product. Um, if we can involve customers directly in these conversations, I think so much the better. Uh, the power of the Gherkin syntax is that really anyone should be able to write uh, this syntax that can then be turned into automated specifications. So get someone from, from the business perspective who can help with that, the closer to the customer, I think the better. All right. Now this question takes us back to right at the end of your presentation, um, the slide portion when you said, are there questions? So this popped up then for context. How do you handle non-functional requirements in this instance? Are they written the same way? Uh, no. Uh, so this uh, would not uh, really be related to, to NFRs or non-functional requirements. Um, this really does speak very specifically to the behavior of the system. It's really about building the right product rather than building it right. And uh, there are other aspects of your, your test strategy, your CICD strategy, that should be verifying your NFRs. There are other tools for that, but I, I would not use BDD for NFRs. All right, we're down to our last couple of questions. So if you're someone holding on to a thought, go ahead and pop it in the question area. And George, this person is new to the world of automated tests and from a product owner background. How does Gherkin compare to a tool like Selenium? I've heard about Selenium before. Uh, Gherkin is uh, the uh, the natural language syntax that you can use uh, to uh, basically work with Selenium. And then Selenium you can use as the glue code that would actually execute your Gherkin scenarios. So they often go hand in hand. Uh, you wouldn't, yeah. I. Basically, you can use Gherkin very much to, to drive the way that uh, your Selenium tests are, are then written and executed. And what I learned from your answer is it's Selenium, not Selenium. <laughs> yeah. Learn new things every day, folks. Okay. Uh, how do feature files scenarios relate to user stories, i.e., how can a user story be written to incorporate Gherkin syntax? It's a great question. Uh, so if you are thinking about your user stories in whatever management framework you're using, whether it's JIRA or version one or whatever else like that, or even just post-it notes on a, a whiteboard, um, you know, we basically are talking about the user stories in all the traditional, uh, form that we are accustomed to with, you know, some sort of a summary of what the story is, what the expected behavior is, and uh, some sort of acceptance criteria. Uh, the the Gherkin scenarios uh, can be appended to that uh, and actually incorporated into JIRA or version one or whatever. But what then makes it super powerful is to take those given when then scenarios and incorporate them into uh, your code base and check them in. So if, you know, just looking at my my Java IDE here, these wind up being files that are incorporated into the overall solution and they get checked in, committed, and part of my CI CD pipeline. Uh, I think maybe back to the, the heart of the question in terms of uh, the, traditional acceptance criteria and then how this ties into it, uh, we can have the usual, as a person doing this, I need this to happen so that blah, 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 
Of course, that's not the Gherkin syntax. What you can then do is once you have that conversation where the rules are hashed out in that user story, you can attach the examples that are in the example mapping session and then translate them into this uh, this Gherkin syntax here. And uh, they can be included in the JIRA uh, stories, uh, but then more powerfully would be actually incorporated into the code. But they they are there as a way to supplement, enhance uh, what uh, we otherwise uh, have done to approach what a user story is with your usual acceptance criteria. Wonderful. All right, we're going to chop off the questions there. If you do have a question, come up, info at lightspeed.com. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you'd like to bring George or someone nearly as awesome as George to your team for custom BDD, DevOps, or certified Scrum developer training, please reach out. Um, George, any parting words for this crew? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I love BDD. I have a, a passion for testing. Uh, I've been doing a lot of test-driven development for, I guess, decades now. Um, and as as long as it's been around, I still find there are a lot of groups and organizations that are still finding it and finding passion in it as well. And I'd love to work with you to uh, to really harness that and uh, make it work for you. Awesome. And George, thank you so much for the presentation. It was awesome. Thank you. If you are thinking, can I watch this later? Yes, you can. You'll receive a link to the recording in about an hour if you watch live or it will be on lightspeed.com later on sometime this week. So thanks again. Have a great day and we're going to shut this down. See you, George. Thanks, Audrey. <laughs> Have a good one. You too.